Um, I'm starting uh, in the name of God, the merciful, the font of mercy, the giver of mercy. Praise is God's, um, as is his due, and we can never ultimately give him his due. And peace and blessings are with Muhammad and his progeny, everlasting without end, again, as we can never give them their due. Um, I don't, unlike my uh, predecessors, I do not have a polished paper, so I'll be upfront and say I'm going to wing it. Um, and, but the reason why I did accept uh, Maulana Adavi's uh, invitation when it came was because I recognized that it would be a privilege to speak here. Um, anything associated with the Imam is a privilege, just like it is your privilege to be here. Um, the organizers should not feel the need to thank you for coming. Um, it's your privilege to have come in the first place. Um, and I c congratulate you on staying so far. Um, and it's a privilege because the, the kalam of the Imam is something very important. As he himself says in the Nahaj at one place, Nahnu Umara al Kalam. We are the Amirs of Kalam. And I won't even try and translate Kalam as speech because speech would not, again, uh, render the, the variety of nuances that the term has. And so one feels a certain element of awe, of, of Hayra, in fact, in front of the, the word. Um, and a less foolish person than me would perhaps have gone with um, Wittgenstein and said, well, of that work which we cannot know, perhaps we should stay silent. Um, but, as I said, I'm a bit more foolish than that, so I will try and say a few things. Before I, I come to philosophy, just one further word. I, I, I'm really um, very grateful, actually, to uh, Maulana Alibi and those who have really insisted that we have something on the Nahj al because the Nahj, in many ways, is a text which is Muslim. There's no doubt about it. Um, we don't pay enough attention to it, and it's in many ways surprising. Because if people, for example, ask us who we are, we say we are Shia Ali, and so then the obvious response then is, well, who is Ali? So how do we answer that? Well, a very simple thing would be, he is the person who spoke these words, and we can present it. But the fact is, we cannot present it because we don't even know what it is to begin with. It is madhloom. And an element of that madhloom, uh, madhloomiya, is the fact that my own copy of the Nahaj, which I brought with me and which I will present some things from, um, has, to my shame, been lying on my shelf for at least two years without having been picked up. So, it's, uh, I think this is probably quite a common um, occurrence around uh, communities that even if we do have the text, it's a bit like the Quran in that sense. We keep it in a nice place. Um, we very rarely open it. And even if we open it, we do not really make the effort to understand it. And that understanding, that lack of understanding is partly um, um, uh, exacerbated by the fact that we who are not um, those who speak uh, Arabic, we are the people who are not of Arabic, um, do not have access to the text in any useful and uh, particularly reliable manner. Um, you're all familiar with the fact that the English translations are hopeless, to be perfectly honest. And I can also say, and people might disagree with me, but the Urdu, example, uh, the Urdu translations are equally hopeless. Um, so we have a problem. We have a huge problem, and I'm very grateful for the work of Maulana Ali to really try and deal with that problem of how do we then bring this text forward so that if someone asks us who we are and we say Shia Ali, and we say, yes, this is Ali ibn Abi Talib And that's a fundamental um, uh, responsibility that we do have. Now, with respect to philosophy, there are lots of problems with raising the question of philosophy in the Nahaj. At one level, it's not a problem at all. Um, for those of you who are familiar will know Ayatollah Jabadi Amuli has a very good pet book, which is called Hikmate Nazari Wa Amali Da Nahaj So he's already written a book on this, and for those of you interested, you can go off and just read it. Um, 
But that is in, within a particular context of what we understand by philosophy. Fundamentally, the problem is, if I talk about philosophy in the Nehej, there are two types of objections, or two types of sets of objections which could be raised. One, uh, for example, would be from those who are interested in philosophy, and they would, if we then presented some of these texts, would not really understand what it was. Because philosophy as an academic discipline, particularly in the Anglo-American world, has very little to do with most of the concerns which are presented in the khutbahs, the letters, and the sayings. Uh, philosophy, although it, of course it's improving to a certain extent, but broadly speaking, after what's known as a linguistic term, um, most philosophers have been rather obsessed with the language and with very narrow understandings of what language and meaning can pertain to, so much so that one sometimes gets the impression that they don't really think there is anything outside of language. Um, it's purely linguistic analysis. Now that doesn't have necessarily have to be negative all the way, but it does mean that it's, uh, it's limited what we understand by philosophy dramatically. And so if we present something which talks about the nature of God, which talks about the nature of humanity, uh, tries to understand what we are, where we have come from, where we are going, these fundamental questions of the Alpha and the Omega, the fundamental questions of the Magda wal Ma'ad, the, the fundamental questions of whence, what, who, whither. These are all like actually, uh, this phrase of uh, wisdom, philosophy is about where we're coming from, what we are, where we're going, is actually a, um, a paraphrase of a very famous saying of the Mamali. Um, doesn't arise, and it seems a bit strange. And then we can then ask this question, well, if we are describing this as philosophy and we're presenting it to um, an audience interested in philosophy, why are we doing that? Now, of course, we know in, um, in European culture, philosophy has a privileged status. It is considered very much, to, to a large extent, although increasingly you could argue science is displacing it, um, as uh, the most important Discipline is the most important in intellectual inquiry. It is something which basically, uh, going back to Aristotle, establishes the framework for how we inquire into everything. Everything, that, that what we can see, what we cannot see, what we can feel, uh, what we can analyze, categories, and so forth. But at the same time, if we define something as philosophy, are we doing justice to it if that initial work does not itself define itself as philosophy? If we call, for example, Imam Ali as a philosopher, are we not diminishing him by doing that? Because we're placing him in a certain category which allows him to be kind of sealed off in a particular way and uh, addresses a particular type of audience. But it is a diminishing, it is a, con uh, a confinement, it's a restriction of what the Imam is because we have to always remember one of the other reasons why this text is important because the Imam is the Lisan Allah. He is the tongue of God. This is, in a sense, divine speech. It is not Kalamullah in the sense of the Quran, but it's still divine speech because it is the manifestation of the divine who is speaking. It is the Lisan Allah, it is the Wajhullah who is speaking. And if one does not, obviously as a believer, one has a certain attitude towards that, others may not. Coming from the other side, um, there is also a problem if I define uh, the contents of the Nahaj as philosophy. And that is um, a objection which comes from within us. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the uh, tendencies that are around, which are quite hostile to the concept of falsafa, or the concept of hikmah, as a particular type of discipline. Uh, philosophy is seen as something which is extrinsic to the Muslim tradition. It's something which comes from outside. It's Greek. It's, um, it's part of a conspiracy. It's something which is uh, about uh, forcing uh, Muslims to subject to modes of thought which are outside of their tradition. It's a type of um, intoxication and infatuation of something which is inauthentic. Now, increasingly, this is uh, becoming... Um, quite an important tendency. Uh, it's also a tendency which you find in the Hawza, which uh, the ulama here will be familiar with. And 
there are different ways I can respond to that. Uh, the most obvious way I can respond to that is by saying that when I'm talking about philosophy, I'm talking about hikmah, I'm not talking about falsafa. And most of the philosophers in the Islamic tradition, and I'll mention one a bit later, the obvious one, Mullah Sadr, and how can I not talk about Mullah Sadr, since I work on him, um, they are interested in hikmah. And for them, hikmah is not something which is extrinsic to the tradition. For them, hikmah is something which is deeply embedded in the revelation itself. They, for example, start with the fact that hikmah is a Quranic word. It is mentioned in the Quran. That they uh, quote the very famous uh, verse from Surah Al-Baqarah, um, Yu'ta al-Hikmah um, you know, He gives wisdom, he gives hikmah, he gives philosophy, perhaps, if you want, to whoever he wills. And whoever has been given it, has been given a great good, khayran kathira, something which is a good, which is greatly good, it's abundantly good. There's a concept of abundance. So this is something which is divinely bestowed. This is precisely what the hokama actually understand by this word. And then, of course, there are very many um, hadith, precisely, which mention hikmah. Um, there's, for example, hikmah to Dalat al-Mu'min. Hikmah is the lost property, if you will. It's a rather simplistic translation, but we'll go with that at the moment. The lost property of the believer. Or even more salient, which brings us back to the Imam, is the famous saying, which you are all familiar with. One um, uh, sort of variant of it is, أَنَا مَدِينَةُ الْحِكْمَةِ وَعَلِيُّ الْبَابُهَا You're all familiar with this saying. But you're probably familiar with ilm being used instead of hikmah. So this is something which is very much embedded in it. And if you read uh, the works uh, on hikmah by someone like Mullah Sabha, they place it right at the front. This is precisely what we're doing. We're not doing something extrinsic to the tradition. We're not doing something ex uh, extrinsic to the revelation. But we're trying to bring out the ultimate truths and claims about the nature of reality, about the nature of what it means to be human from within the text itself, from within the divine speech itself. And this is absolutely essential. Now, one uh, further way I'm going to try and gloss this, like I'll give you a definition of, of Hikmah, which I think can then lead us to the text, and I should probably move rapidly onto the text. Um, is that the definitions that someone like uh, Mullah Sadr gives for hikmah are about the perfection of the human self. But it's about the perfection of the human self in particular ways. For example, the, the, that perfection lies through the ability to construct arguments, the ability to construct conclusive and demonstrative arguments <coughs> as it is in the Al-Shatim tradition. To understand things without having to have recourse to authority, without taqlid, as it says. And we know that all of us pay lip service to the fact that uh, we don't believe in taqlid in matters of faith and reality, and yet none of us actually practice this in reality. Um, and what is the function of this? What, where are we going with the perfection of the self to understand? It is so that our self, our, our intellect, the, the, the identity of what we are, can become a alim, can become someone who knows, but can also, in a sense, become an alim, can become a rational order, so that we can understand the rational order within and without ourselves. So that we can understand reality, so to speak, from a divine, uh, or God's um, perspective, a divine perspective. And because the very notion is that the, the divine has created the world in such a way, in uh, with a certain wise purpose that everything is ordered, everything is arranged. And so we can understand that arrangement, we can understand how things relate to each other, we can understand how humans are related to each other, we can understand what role animals have, we can understand the environment around us. And then that basic understanding leads to important ethical commitments for what we do. Because knowledge is never something passive, it's not, okay, we understand what reality is, fine, that's interesting. But rather, it's knowing that then impels us to act in a particular way so that we understand where things are in place and we give them their due. So we do not 
practice lul in that very simple sense. <coughs> the second aspect of the definition which I think is very important is one tendency which actually is happening in contemporary philosophy is to, which is to argue that philosophy is not something which is purely abstract. But rather, when we're practicing philosophy, we're doing something. We're actually living in a particular way. We're, we have ethical commitments. We don't just have commitments to ways of thought. So hikmah, for example, is a way of life. It's not just about the use of the aql in a simple sense of the word reason. But rather, it's the idea that the aql is an expression of the self, and there are various other expressions of the self which allow understanding to flourish. And these other expressions of the self we call spiritual exercises, which was mentioned earlier. So the fact that we sit in a particular way, the fact that we perform certain practices, we, perform, we, we invoke the name of God, we train ourselves to live in a particular way. These are all things which which assist understanding. Because what we do understand is that humans fundamentally are not um, kind of disembodied selves. Humans are not floating around independently of each other, but rather humans are very much connected. We're connected, we live in society, we live in communities. So our understanding of who we are and our reality has to similarly be connected in that particular way. We have to live it. We, don't, we can't just articulate certain ideas and leave it at that. And so that means that we have to understand the communal setting, and we also have to understand that uh, the inculcation of philosophical practice has to have someone who teaches you. You have to have a sage who does it. And ultimately, for the, uh, the tradition, the ultimate sage, the ultimate hakim in that sense, who teaches us, is the imam. It's really as simple as that. So you have a complete circle of meaning in which individuals are located, in which they're uh, trying to train their minds to think in particular ways, to understand reality, to practice, understand their engagement, but fundamentally guided by the fact that there is a sage who has done it, who's been there, so to speak, understands it. You read the text, it's obvious he understands it. He totally understands it. The famous uh, saying which was mentioned before, you know, um, even the local you know, even if the veil were were pulled apart so that I would see, literally see reality, it wouldn't make any effort. It wouldn't make any uh, difference on the complete certainty that I have about reality itself. Now, I'm going to very rapidly then um, look at two two texts. Um, Two very simple, uh, well, not simple actually. Um, two rather important uh, texts, which will already be fam uh, familiar to you. One of them, I think, has already been cited at least twice. The first text is, of course, the very first khutbah of the Nahj al It's very famous, and again, uh, for those of you who are lazy like me, the first khutbah, it's a no-brainer. You open the book, it's where it starts. It's very, very easy. Go to the first khutbah. And the, the first khutbah is famous also because it's quite comprehensive. It gives you a, uh, an explanation from the beginning with respect to what is faith, what is God, takes you through uh, the process of creation, takes you to the creation of Adam, takes you to the prophets, to our prophet in particular, and from that uh, then goes on and culminates in some, um, and in the Quran, of course, the expression of the Prophet, and culminates with a passage on the Hajj. And one of the reasons why I picked it, apart from the fact that I'm lazy, is the fact that we're coming up to Hajj. And the, this um, uh, sermon culminates in Hajj. Now, a lot of people looking at this uh, khutbah would say, this is really strange. You know, the Imam is talking about God, he's talking about the Prophets, he's talking about the Quran, etc. And then he just has these lines of Hajj, well, what, why? It doesn't seem to be obviously connected in any sort. He's not mentioning any other ritual practices which are incumbent. But, there is, I think, an obvious scheme here at work. 
in the sense that the Hajj is a culmination of this because the Hajj is the preparation for the return. What this khutbah is doing in its entirety is explaining where we come from, what we are, how are we relating to that reality from which we come, and then how do we return. And the fundamental step in that return precisely is the Hajj. And there's two ways he does it. One is by alluding to the obvious fact that the Hajj is this preparation for the uh, for the final meeting. It's the Miqat, which prefigures the Miqat, where we will ultimately be meeting God in the afterlife. But also because we are, through our act of Hajj, through our reversion, we are also express, expressing a conscious and volitional act of returning to God. And we're doing that by imitating the practice of the angels. For example, in that passage he says, that you know, we the reason why we do tawaf is because the angels do tawaf of the arsh. Very, very simple idea, but that's precisely by doing that we are imitating the angels. So we are imitating those who are entirely in concordance with the divine will, because that's what we want. That's the rada that we seek. Someone was talking about the spiritual path before. One of the fundamental um, uh, steps, if arguably the ultimate step, of course, in the spiritual path is, the path is this rada, the, the fact that you have the will, the contentment of the divine. And that's what you want to be doing here. So uh, there's lots of other things, and I can't even begin to touch on this. I, you know, I was thinking earlier that um, with most of these khutbahs, there are, of course, voluminous commentaries, but um, you could easily write volumes just on why it's called Nehru Balaba. You could easily write volumes on the famous uh, passage, which I will have a look at briefly, you know, um, it's pretty dark. Awal al-Din al-Ma'afatul, right? What does the who refer to? What is who? You know, this is a very, very simple, like really profound and problematic thing in itself. Before you get to the question of Ma'afat, what, what is who? Who is who? So, um, there, thank you. Um, although I couldn't see how many minutes it said. Um, I'm assuming I know, yeah. Uh, so there, there are these very important elements in the khutbah, and that, that, that passage is very famous. You know, the beginning of faith, beginning, uh, the commencement on the path, is to understand it himself. But the end, oh well, I don't think is necessarily just the beginning, it's also the culmination. I mean, to say that uh, you can only really have faith if you have the mind of God is being really harsh on us. Because most of us, frankly, do not have the mind of God. We have no idea what that even means. So, awal, in the sense of the ultimate, the ultimate of the faith is this. And then it goes, you know, in the Kamal uh, Ma'arifati, Tasdiqu Bihe. And, you know, this is, this, this is a very, very famous passage. You know, what does it mean to affirm him? What does the, the affirmation mean? It's relating to the Tawheed. What does the Tawheed mean? It, meaning it, you have to sincerely and selflessly give for him, to be, actually sincerely be for him, exist for him, and then goes on to what that means, negation of attributes to him. And this is not attributes in a simple sense. I mean, sometimes people say, well, this, what this means is, this is classic Mu'tazili theology, um, these attributes, you know, mercy, wrath, etc., these are not real. Actually, something which is, in some ways, I think, much more sensible and, and simple is being said here, which is that um, any sincerity, any purity of belief in God has to recognize that the language we use for God is completely impoverished. We, for example, may say that God has mercy, right? And we, when we say this often because the Quran says so, but we have no understanding of what that means because we understand what humans understand by mercy and that's it. And there's a limit to that. So, the negation of attributes means the ne ultimately the negation of language, so much so that one cannot say anything before God except silence. And that's, it's as simple as that. And all we do in our kind of uh, rather humble ways is to try and make sense. That brings me back to the famous uh, definition of, of Mullah Sadr. One of the things he says is that this endeavor is it's only insofar as humans can possibly do it. And humans are of different types, and humans have different istidaas and taqas with respect to this. 
but the ultimate human, the insan kamal, and uh, you know, uh, Rebecca mentioned this before, it's all about becoming human, and we can only become human if we know what a human is. And we know what a human is because we know, we like to think we know what Ali ibn Abi Talib is. And the way we know it is uh, for the Nahaj. I was going to mention another khutbah, the, the one I actually picked was 110 because of course it's Ya Ali. Um, but you can go off and read that yourself. You could do some homework. Um, the other one I'll just quickly mention, have a look at 152 as well. Um, but um, anyway, as I said, uh, it's your privilege to be here. Um, thank you for sticking with it, and uh, thank you for, for bearing with me. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no.